Good morning, church. How you doing? Man, look at all the young people up here on the front row. Wow, that's great. Way to go, AJ. All right. Love it. Y'all need to be in prayer for these young people as they get ready to go back to church or back to church. Glad you're back at church, but school, right? Going to school. Hey, I, you know, I, uh, I just believe that the world that we're living in is crazy. Uh, I think that the world that we're living in has uh, really gone far out. In my almost 75 years of life, I have never seen it so crazy. I mean, there are a lot of things going on. And, and the truth of it is that everybody here has something going on. Everybody here has an issue. Everybody here has some kind of stress, uh, some kind of worry, some kind of problem that they're dealing with. And, and if you're here and you say, well, that's not me, well, wait till tomorrow because it's going to happen. And it happens to all of us. The question for the Christian is, uh, how do you deal with it? Uh, Pastor Brad's been talking about rest the last few weeks, and, and really we're going we're gonna to continue that. How do, you, how do you as a Christian deal with life when it gets lifey? It gets lifey sometimes, doesn't it? We got so many things going on uh, today that we're dealing with. Sharon and I sometimes will make this statement. When things get back to normal, y'all ever go there? But then we decide that things never are. And, and then you have to wonder, what is normal anymore? I mean, you may be here today and you're dealing with some issues. I mean, you're dealing with some financial issues. Listen, there are businesses closing down. There, are, there is a lot of financial stuff happening. There are people losing their jobs. There's a lot of stuff going on. And maybe you're dealing with a financial issue. Maybe it's a health issue. You know, you go to the doctor and he takes some blood and he does some tests and the next day you get a call from his nurse and his nurse says, the doctor wants to see you. Can I share with you that's never a good thing? It's never a good thing. And what's worse is they say, well, but it'll be seven days before they can see you. So what do you do for those seven days, knowing that the doctor found something in your blood work, found something in your test that's wrong? You stress out, right? I mean, you worry. And we always think of the worst. We never think of it could be something that's not too bad. Maybe it's family problems. Man, I shared to the first service, we have seven grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren. And our, when, your, when your grandchildren start having children and your family starts to expand, you know, back when it was just Sharon and I, it wasn't too bad. But when your family starts expanding and you got all these other issues, I guarantee you, there's not hardly a day goes by where somebody hasn't got something going on. And so your stress level is, is out there. And you know what I found out is no matter how old they are, they're still your kids. They still have problems, but my kids seem to have bigger problems than when they were going to school and little Susie broke up with them, you know, or whatever. Don't have anybody to go to the prom with. <laughs> it's a little bit different than that. So maybe it's a family. Maybe it's the recent loss of a loved one. A lot of folks dying from COVID. There's a lot of people dying from all kinds of different things. Maybe you lost a loved one. And, and you're dealing with that. Uh, maybe it's this COVID altogether. You know, COVID's enough to cause stress. You know, you watch the news and 3,000 people tested positive, you know. Uh, you're never rejoicing at any of that. It's stressful. I mean, we were down in Arkansas to where we had under 2,000 people that were active with COVID. Now, I don't know what the numbers are. And half of you don't believe the numbers anyway. But it causes stress. You know what else it causes? It's, it's causing division in the family. 
There are families that are divided over, do we mask? Do we don't mask? You know, do we get a shot? Do we not get a shot? And families are actually divided over that. But you know what's even worse than that is the church family. Church families divided over this. Listen, you need to keep your eyes on Jesus and keep your eyes off all that stuff. You know, if you come to worship Jesus Christ, and you come into a worship service and you're more concerned about whether somebody's masked or somebody's not masked or whether somebody mandated a mask or whether the person next to you's got a vaccine or not got a vaccine, you ain't focusing on Jesus. And we're here to worship God. We're here to worship him, not to debate uh, COVID or whatever else goes on. Listen, that's for Facebook, right? <laughs> You better never put that on Facebook, man. You'll get some ugly responses real quick. Some people, what do some people do? Some people turn to drugs. You know, in, in, in Fort Smith, there's hardly a day goes by that somebody doesn't OD and die off from drugs. Or there are people that are sent to the hospital because of ODing on drugs because Frankly, they can't handle life and they're dealing with a substitute. Uh, some people go to alcohol. Uh, my sister was an alcoholic and basically she was an alcoholic because she couldn't deal with life. But you know what? Those are temporary solutions. Those drugs and alcohol may make you feel okay for a little while. But folks, it's going to wear off. What I know about Jesus is that Jesus is the permanent solution. You don't need drugs and alcohol. You need Jesus. And I guarantee you that Jesus being a permanent solution, Jesus is the one that's going to be there with you. He's the one that's going to walk with you through things. As a matter of fact, there's one foot of footprints in the sand. You know why? Because you ain't walking. He's carrying you through it. Well, do you know what it's like to go through something in your life and have Jesus carry you through it? What's that worth? It's permanent. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to be there. He says, bring all your cares and all your woes to me. The problem with us is we try to deal with it ourselves. I don't understand why Christians sometimes, they, uh, they try to handle things themselves. And, you know, when I try to handle things myself in, in my life, you know what happens? They get worse. They don't get better. When are we going to find out that at the beginning of things, we need to go to Christ and turn it over to him? Quit trying to deal with it. Paul in the Colossians 3 writes about how to live the Christian life in fullness, in joy, no matter what's going on. In honor of God's word, would you stand as we read Colossians 3? I'm going to read the first eight verses. So if you have been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above where the Messiah is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with the Messiah and God. When the Messiah who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your worldly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath comes on the disobedient. And once you walked in these things, when you were living in them, but now... You must also put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. You may be seated. There's a lady by the name of Helen Lemmel. Helen is the one that wrote the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, one of the favorite hymns of of all times. Helen was born in England in 1863. And when she was just a young child, her parents immigrated and they came to the United States. 
Helen had loved music. Uh, she ended up going later on in life. She went to Germany to uh, study music in Germany, and there she met a, a wealthy man, and she ended up getting married. And the problem is that Helen became blind. And when she became blind, her faithful husband left her. At the age of 55, Helen heard these words in a message, and it changed her life. Turn your eyes upon him. Look full into his wonderful face, and you will see the things of earth will acquire a strange new dimness. That same week, she took that chorus and she wrote that hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Helen ended up living in a one-room uh, apartment in poverty. But when asked the question, how are things going with you? Here's what Helen replied. I am doing well in the things that count, the things of Jesus. How about you this morning? I think Helen got it right. Are you doing well in the things that count? The things of Jesus? To walk with him in this troubled world? Boy, I'm telling you, we need a closer walk with Jesus in this world that we're living in right now. It's also built on a believer's knowledge of Jesus. Jesus asked his disciples, he said, uh, who do you say I am? This morning, that question goes before you. Who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? You know, the more we learn about Jesus, the more we understand how much he loves us and cares for us, the more you and I trust him with these things, these issues, these stress factors that come up in life, the more we can turn over them. Listen, Jesus is the wonderful son of God. Jesus is the reason that uh, for our salvation. And Jesus loves you so much that he was willing to go and die on the old rugged cross just for you. Jesus puts a new song in your heart. Jesus actually puts pep in your step. There ought to be a different walk about you when you come to know Christ. We serve a risen Savior, folks, and he's in the world today. And he wants to carry you through these troubled times. Look at verse 1 again. So if you have been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above, where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. Why is Paul writing that? He's writing that because in that day, the false teachers were teaching that Jesus was not the Son of God. As a matter of fact, they said that Jesus wasn't enough for salvation, that you had to add something to it. You had to learn a bunch of stuff. You had to go through all these rituals and stuff, that Jesus just wasn't enough. Paul says, I've got good news for you. Jesus is enough. Christ is all I need, right? Jesus is enough. You don't add anything to it. You don't take anything away from it. Jesus is enough. And not only that, Paul says, I've got good news for you. He is the son of God. And not only is he the son of God, but he's sitting at the right hand of majesty in a place of authority in a place of honor. Man, when I pray, I picture that. I picture Jesus sitting there at the right hand of God in all majesty, in all authority. Paul says, I have been raised with the Messiah. That's your salvation. That's when you came to Christ and asked him to come into your life as Lord and Savior. You've been raised with him. When we received a new life and that life changes us, that life changes our mind, that life changes the way we used to be. 
You know, sometimes as a pastor through the years, I, uh, you know, when, I don't know if you can even do this anymore, but you go up to the hospital and you go to the ICU to visit a family or you go to an ICU and, and, and you know, you visit a patient or whatever. And, and there's, there used to be rooms out there. You remember those, those rooms out there and they would have a family name on those rooms. That means that when they call a family together and there's a name on that room, that means that somebody's in real bad shape. And you go into this room and it's, it's, it's Christians, it's people, you know, that, that know Jesus. And you go in there and you, you pray with them and you're able to, uh, to help them through this struggling times. But I've always wondered about this other room where the family doesn't know Jesus. You see, when you come to Jesus, it changes things. It changes the way you're, you're to respond. It changes the way, to your, way you react. It changes things. It changes your whole life. The more you love Jesus and the more you know about Jesus, the more you're going to trust him with the things in your life. Look at verse 2. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. In Philippians, Paul said this, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is any praise, dwell on these things. Listen, you know what Paul's saying? Don't get bogged down with these earthly things. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't get bogged down by the everyday stuff that comes into your life. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. There are people that quit coming to church because they get bogged down on earthly things. No, keep your eyes upon Jesus. You see, when you're going through something, that's when you really need to come together with your brothers and sisters in Christ in a time of fellowship. Look up. Don't look down. That word seek is an interesting word there because it, it has an urgency about it. It means that you're going to seek Christ with an urgency. It means that there's an urgency about your, your Bible study time, your, your prayer time. There's an urgency about that. You just can't wait to talk to Jesus again. You just can't wait to get into his word. There's an urgency about it. Some have forgot about that urgency. Some aren't seeking Jesus in their everyday life. The more you know about him, the better. Think about what you have in Christ. I love where it says that we have a peace that passes all understanding. Have you been there? I mean, something happened in your life and, and you, if, if you'd have thought about it the day before, you say, you know, I, I can never handle this. But then something happens in your life and there's this peace that passes all understanding that comes into your life and, and Jesus is there to walk you through something. It's amazing how that happens. You think of joy unspeakable you think of the love that Jesus has for you. You think of the mercy that Jesus uh, gives towards you. You think of forgiveness of sin. You think of his grace. You see, everything for the Christian is to be based on a heavenly view, not an earthly view. Mama said it's not always going to be this way. <laughs> Do you know what the Bible says the same thing? It's not always going to be this way. We ought to have a heavenly view of things. And that isn't all. Look at verse 3. For you have died and your life is hidden with the Messiah in God. Now, when Jesus died on that cross, he took your place and you actually died with him. We say, you know, at, at baptism, uh, buried with Jesus and raised to walk in newness of life. The baptism is a beautiful picture I love that because I was able to baptize my children. And when I, when I got to the point that 
As you know, Sharon and I had two children and we adopted two children. And my adopted daughter, when she accepted Christ and I was able to baptize her, she came down the stairs. I got the, all of a sudden God put in my mind about how we're adopted into the family of God. And man, this old boy lost it up there. I mean, I, I couldn't, I didn't even, I couldn't say nothing. And finally, the pastor got up and said, that's Bob's adopted daughter. Just go ahead and dip her, Bob. <laughs> Man, chunked her down in the water. It's amazing. Raised to walk in newness of life, a genuine spiritual experience begins with our understanding and our identification with Christ. Our life is hidden. I'm one of them old fashioned preachers. I believe what saved always saved. I believe the Bible says no man may pluck you out of my hands. That's what John says. You come to, you come to John 10 and it says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish ever. That's like never, no, never. He says it twice for us just to make sure we get it. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. You know what that means? You can't even goof this up. That means once Jesus comes into your life, he's there. But I, as a pastor, I've heard people come in and, and uh, they, they doubt their salvation. They doubt their salvation because they got involved in something or they did something. And listen, you have to explain to them, did you in fact invite Jesus to come into your life? Did he do it? Yes. Well, then he's still there. Jesus doesn't move. It's us that move. We see Jesus... And then the exciting thing about that is that you're doubly secure. Did you ever notice that? He says you're secure in Jesus, but he said then you're secure in God too. You're secure in him. Nobody is able to snatch you out of my hand and nobody's able to snatch you out of my father's hand. Man, it's double security. That's like locking the lock and hitting the deadbolt. It's all there. Keep your eyes on the fact that you have double security. Don't let the devil come in and start getting you to doubt your salvation when you're going through something. Because he knows that you're down and he knows that you're vulnerable at that point. Keep your eyes on the fact you got double security. Once saved, always saved. Keep your eyes on those things. And if that's not good enough, look at verse 4. When the Messiah, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Paul says, we've looked at who your life is when you're coming to Christ, but now he says, guess what you got looking forward to? Wow, I'm telling you what, as a Christian, you got a glorious future. Man, I read about them streets of gold and Walls paved with all kinds of jewels and all that kind of stuff. And it don't mean anything to me. You know why? Because I also read that the center of it all is my Lord Jesus Christ. And my focus of heaven is this. Someday I'm going to see my Jesus face to face. And you know, somehow when I concentrate on that, when I think about that, the things of the world grow strangely dim. When I think of someday I'm going to be able to look at my Savior's face, when I think of someday that I'm going to see those nail-scarred hands, whatever's going into my life all of a sudden became a secondary issue. I love that song, I Can Only Imagine. I can only imagine sometimes when I'm doing a funeral service, I'll share with the family that you and I can only imagine what Jesus looks like, but your loved one knows. Can only imagine, but I know that someday I'm going to see him. I know someday there's going to be a day where I'm going to be with him and I'm not going to have the troubles of the world. Listen, there's no COVID in heaven. There's no cancer in heaven. There's no pain in heaven. The Bible says there's even no more tears in heaven. 
someday. The very fact that we have a glorious future ought to set our souls on fire. It ought to light Baptist up. It ought to get Baptist just happy and know what you got to look forward to in Jesus. Paul doesn't want the believer to forget that no matter what you're dealing with in life, no matter what's going on in your life, you need to understand who Jesus is. You need to understand how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, and that he's there with you. Listen, nothing sneaks up on Jesus. Jesus doesn't look over the portals of heaven someday and say, I didn't see that coming to his life or her life. He knows what's going on in your life. He knew it before it happened. And he wants to carry you through that. He wants to help you through all that. Keep your eyes on the one that loves you. Keep your eyes on the one who lives in you. Keep your eyes on the fact that you're secure in Christ. Verses five through seven say this. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your worldly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath comes on the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now you must also put away all the following. And then he goes on and talks about anger and wrath and all these things. Keep your eyes on. Here he's talking about spiritual living. How do you keep your eyes upon Jesus and be involved in the things of the world? Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I've heard people say, well, he has one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. No, that doesn't work. Either both feet are in or no feet are in. You can't live out, go out here and live like the, the world all, all week long and come in here and expect to worship Jesus. It doesn't happen. You got these things in your life, you need to get rid of these things because you can't keep your eyes upon Jesus and focus on Christ if you're living a life with all these things in. Paul says that's from the old life. That's the way you used to be. You ain't there no more. You ain't supposed to be there no more. Your life has changed. You're, you're, you're different. Our attitudes and our behaviors are to reflect the new man, not the old man. Should be a testimony of a changed life. I have people say that they, they hate it. Some of the waiters in the, in the businesses, you know, they'll say in the restaurants, we hate it on Sunday because we know that's when the Christians are coming. What a testimony that is. Because Christians are some of the most evil, low-tipping people around. <laughs> You're to be identified with Christ. You're to keep your eyes upon Christ. You're an example. A testimony of him. Now look at the rest of verse 8. But now you must also put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. I'm telling you, Paul is saying, you got to put these things off. You don't need these things in, in your life. And he's saying, you got to put them off like you would a, a dirty clothing. Discard it, put it off. Anger is an emotion that can boil over. And when it boils over, it goes to wrath. And the wrath goes to an unforgiving spirit. Listen, you can't keep your eyes upon Jesus if you've got unforgiveness in your heart. It just doesn't work. We are to forgive like Jesus forgave us. But there are people who are carrying grudges around. There are people who, who have taken anger and have changed their wrath to where they can't even mention a person's name or see a person in the hallway without boiling over and getting all mad over something. There are some people who have been mad and angry at somebody for so long they forgot what they were angry about, but I know I'm angry about something. You see, you can't hold on to that stuff and worship Jesus. You can't hold on to that stuff and, and keep your eyes upon Jesus. You need to get rid of that stuff in your life. The problem with anger anyway is that we usually get mad, or, uh, get mad about things that don't really matter. 
get upset over something that doesn't matter at all. I heard she said that he said that she said that her cousin said. <laughs> you get all angry over stuff. If you want to get real angry, drive down Rogers Avenue. That'll get you boiling right there. Now that's real anger. That's good stuff right there. But don't hold on to anger. Folks, you can't worship Jesus. You can't keep your eyes on Jesus if you've got an angry heart, an unforgiving spirit. It doesn't happen. Malice is anger that wants to turn to revenge. You know, I'm not only mad about this person, I can't stand to even see this person, but I want revenge. I'm going to get back at them for what they did to me. You can't worship Jesus and keep your eyes upon Jesus if you got that kind of stuff in your life. Slander has two meanings. One meaning of slander is this, that you say something about somebody uh, to ruin their reputation. You know, you, you say a slanderous word or thought about somebody and it just ruins their, you want to ruin their reputation. And most of the time, the reason you want to ruin somebody's reputation is because you want to build yourself up to make yourself feel better, right? And so you'll slander somebody. We also call it this. We also call it gossip. Gossip has no place in the church. The second meaning of that is you misrepresent Jesus. You actually uh, are, it's, it's, it's almost a blasphemous type thing that you're misrepresenting Christ. Again, we go back to that restaurant scene. We go back to you getting ugly with somebody. We go back to the fact that you're out here in the world and you're living a life that don't represent Christ. And then we try to get people to come and join the church and say, oh, no, I ain't joining that church. I know some of your members. I try to explain to them, not all my members are saved. but some of the ones that are, are out there in the world misrepresenting Christ. And you may be the one that's hindering somebody from coming to Christ, hindering somebody from coming to Jesus. People should see Jesus in you. There should be a change. There should be a difference. Then he talks about filthy communication, your language, the dirty jokes, the things that you say that come out of your mouth. Paul says you need to control those things. How do you control those things? You keep your eyes upon Jesus. You draw closer to Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. And again, the things of the world grow strangely dim. The question before us this morning is this. Who are you acting more like? The world or Jesus? You know, I don't know what's going on in your life. I, I don't know what you need to turn over to Jesus. Jesus. But I know that everybody in here has something. Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer. And I, I, I think we've gotten away from that. I don't think we sincerely pray in God's house anymore. My house should be a house of prayer. And sometimes that an invitation time, what happens is you're thinking more about what you're going to have for lunch or how fast can I get out of here or whatever. But you know what it should be? An invitation includes everybody. An invitation is a time where you go to Jesus and you talk to him, where you have an opportunity to turn things over. You don't have to come up here. There's nothing magical about up here. You can deal with Jesus right where you're at. But I know if you've got issues in your life, wouldn't it be good today if you started right now in praying to him about what's going on?
talking to him about what's going on, starting to focus and keep your eyes upon Jesus. Maybe your prayer this morning is, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on that cross for me. Forgive me my sin and come into my life. I want to make you Savior and Lord. Maybe that's your prayer this morning. Maybe that's your prayer that you need to come and invite Jesus Christ to come into your life. You say, well, I don't have this peace that passes all understanding. I, I, I don't know how about keeping my eyes upon Jesus. I don't know about that stuff. Maybe that's what you need to do. You need to come to Christ. We have this little card right here that you can fill out. And if today you say, you know what? I felt the need that I need to come to Jesus. I need that peace that Bob was talking about. I need that. Maybe today you're here and you say, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a member of this church. As Stephen talked about, man, it's a good church. It's a great family. We call it the grand family. It's a good family. Maybe you're praying about joining this church and you want to talk to someone more about it. Well, you fill out one of these cards and you say, you know what, I'm thinking about joining your church. I'd like to talk to someone more. And listen, one of our pastors will call you and talk to you more. And then we have a new members class later on that, that you can get involved in. Maybe today you just have a prayer request or something going on in your life. You can put that on there and in staff meeting, we'll pray. We pray over those. Whatever God is laying upon your heart, whatever is keeping you from keeping your eyes upon Jesus, I'm gonna tell you something, folks, you need to deal with that today because again, like we began, it's a crazy world. We all need Jesus to get through it. We all need him in our lives. I'm going to pray and Stephen's going to come and lead us in an invitation hymn. You don't have to sing in this hymn. This time of invitation, you can just bow your head and be in prayer as the Holy Spirit has revealed things in your life that you need to pray about. Why don't you start that today? And pray while Stephen leads us. If you need to speak to someone today about something that's in your life, I'll be hanging around. Other staff will be around and be glad to speak to you and talk to you today, whatever your need. But folks, I'm going to tell you, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus in all things. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. Father, I know that all of us have a hurt, all of us have a pain, all of us have something that we're struggling with in our lives. Father, help us to focus on you, to draw closer to you. Help us to understand who you are. Help us to understand that you love us and you care for us and you want to help us through that. Father, I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit would deal with their hearts and that they'd come to know Christ today. Father, whatever decisions and whatever thoughts that you have laid upon each individual's heart, I pray they would deal with it today. Turn from all that's keeping them from focusing on you. We pray these things today in the name of Jesus, the wonderful Son of God. Amen.